Call the meeting to order, please. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, September 3, 2020. The time is 7 p.m. Please call the roll. President Sell. Here. Trustee Collins. Here. Trustee Gallagos. Here. Trustee Giza. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Haley. Thank you very much. If you'll please join us with the pledge. Thank you and welcome to everyone who is here with us this evening and to those of you watching at home. If you are here with us this evening and you'd like to address the board at any time, I just ask that you be recognized by the president and that you make your comments from the podium so that the folks at home can hear and see what you have to say. So first up is public comment. Would anyone like to address the board this evening? Hearing none, we'll move on to reports of village officers. First up is the village president's report. I have some appointments for this evening. Uh, <clears throat> to appoint Colleen Incandela to the Parks and Recreation Board with a term to expire 2021, to appoint Susan Connor and Greg Briolot to the Ethics Commission, terms to expire 2022, reappoint Jeff Levine to the Ethics Commission, term to expire 2021, and appoint Manager Francis uh, as the Ethics Advisor. I would ask for a motion and a second. So moved. So moved. A motion by Mr. Gallagos. Second. Second by <clears throat> Ms. Collins. Any discussion? I want to thank all of one, all of the appointees uh, that have agreed to serve our village. It's a, a big commitment, and we really appreciate that you take the time and effort to help our, make our village a better place. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. The motion carries, and we do have <coughs> uh, Ms. Ngadala, Ms. Connor, and Mr. Briolot are all here this evening, I believe. Uh, Ms. Ms. Haley, how would you like to administer the oath? You want to do it all at once, or? Well, um, I think we could do um, Parks and Rec first, and then the two Ethics Commissioners. Okay. Is that okay? Ms. Gandela, if you could step up to the podium, please. So if you would please uh, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Colleen Incandela. I, Colleen Incandela. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And I will faithfully perform the duties. And I will faithfully perform the duties of Parks and Recreation Board Member. Of Parks and Recreation Board Member. For the Village of Riverside, Illinois. For the Village of Riverside, Illinois. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. If you could sign for now, uh, Ms. Connor and Mr. Briolot, if you could do the honors, please. to raise your right hand and repeat after me. Um, you'll state your, each state your name individually. <laughs> Aye. Right, right. Aye, Susan Connor, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly, solemnly swear. swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support, support the, the Constitution, Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And I will faithfully perform the duty. I will faithfully I will perform, perform the duty of ethics commissioner. Of ethics ethics commissioner. commissioner for the village of Riverside, Illinois, for the, for the village, village of Riverside, Riverside Illinois, Illinois, to the best of my ability. To the, the best, best of my ability. ability. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. If you could each sign and then um, you can sanitize your hands, if, or if you have your own pen, please feel free. Thank you very much. We'll move on now to the village manager's report. Manager Francis. I do not have a report this evening. 
Moving on to the approval of the consent agenda on the agenda this evening, approve the voucher list of bills September 3, 2020, approve the Village Board of Trustees special meeting and regular meeting minutes of August 20, 2020, review and file the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting minutes of June 24, 2020, a motion to approve the special event application for the Riverside Brookfield High School cross country meets on September 8 and September 26, 2020, and a resolution authorizing the sale or disposal of personal property owned by the Village of Riverside. Do any items need, be, need to be removed for discussion? I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve. So moved. Motion by Mr. Gallegos. Second. Se second by Ms. Collins. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Next up are reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? Hearing none, we'll move on then to ordinances and resolutions. We have one ordinance this evening, an ordinance approving an expansion of an existing special use permit and several variations to allow the construction of a new clubhouse as well as associated new swimming pool, sport court, and fence improvements at 100 Blooming Bank Road, Riverside, Riverside Swim Club. Director Apt. Yes, um, the Riverside Swim Club uh, is proposing to demolish their existing clubhouse and pool area and build new facilities. Uh, the new proposed clubhouse and pools will be located in approximately the same location as the previous uses. And there are no changes proposed to the parking lot except to restripe to provide the required number of handicap accessible parking spaces. Um, outdoor recreation usage, such as a, a swim club, are considered special uses in the R1A district. Um, and any addition, enlargement, or expansion of that special use must conform to the requirements for special uses. Therefore, an expansion of the special use permit is required. Um, the proposed clubhouse and associated pool and sport court improvements <clears throat> in the fencing uh, don't meet the bulk requirements and other requirements of the R1A district and collectively do require several variations. These include variations from the rear yard setback, um, from the maximum impervious surface area of 50%, um, from the fence restrictions that prohibit fences in street yards and restrict fence height and materials, and um, also from the setbacks for sport courts, as well as the setbacks for decks. And there is um, a proposed wood composite deck, the sport court and the fence, which will all encroach into the required street yard, um, and that is along Blooming Bank Road. Uh, the new clubhouse uh, will encroach into the required rear yard. It will only be three feet, three inches set back from the rear property line, and that is the property line that is adjacent to um, the parking lot and the railroad tracks to the north. Um, <clears throat> the fence also requires variations for its height and material. The proposed fence um, is going to be eight feet tall in the street yard and then 10 feet high um, along the side and rear property lines. Uh, the maximum allowed height for fencing is six feet high um, and the proposed fence along the side and the rear property lines is going to be a chain link fence that has privacy slatting in it. And while our ordinance does allow for coded chain link fences, it does not specifically allow privacy slatting within those fences. And so therefore, um, we put that in as a variance request as well. Um, additionally, the proposed improvements, <clears throat> in addition to the existing parking lot area, exceeds the maximum impervious surface of 50% allowed on a lot in the R1A district. Um, they're proposed um, at the time impervious um, surface coverage was going to be 78.4%. The Planning and Zoning Commission held their, held their public hearing uh, last week on August 26th. Uh, the petitioners explained that with IDPH and ADA requirements, um, in order to rebuild their facility, several variations were needed um, to build on that existing site. Um, they also explained that they had attempted to address some of the commission's concerns that had come in over time um, and had made some proposed modifications to their original plan that was submitted. And this included shifting the pool deck further back to allow for more green space <clears throat> along uh, Blooming Bank Road and which slightly reduced the impervious surface area. Um, at the hearing, the commissioners had questions about impervious surface, stormwater detention, um, the height of the fencing as well as some concern about that reduction of the open space along Blooming Bank Road and the loss of trees. Um, as part of that conversation, um, the swim club stated that they would be able to narrow down um, 
the north side of the pool area which would provide a little bit more open space and reduce the impervious surface overall um, so that would provide a nine foot seven inch setback from the property line along blooming bank road and would allow for more trees uh, to be preserved with that as well um, as part of the discussion, staff noted that the deck area would not count towards impervious surface coverage if they were to make sure that there was gapping between the slats of the deck and if they excavated down underneath the deck at least six inches, put down a permeable fabric, um, and put down uh, non-compacted <clears throat> gravel underneath it. Then the deck would not count towards impervious surface. So all in all, with the reductions that they proposed, um, they also proposed that they could do um, permeable pavers in the front um, for the patio area on the front of the swim club, which would also further reduce the impervious surface coverage, although it would still exceed 50%, so the variance would still be needed. With those accommodations, the impervious surface would drop down from the originally proposed 78% down to a little over 72%. Um, coverage. Again, the maximum allowed there is 50%, but their current coverage is at about 76%. So all in all, you would be getting a net reduction on impervious surface on the site. Additionally, they are required to provide stormwater detention and volume control per the MWRD watershed ordinance, and they are providing that. Um, our engineer has looked at it, and they are meeting the requirements of the MWRD um, uh, code, so they are working towards getting their MWRD permit. Ultimately, the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval of the expansion of the special use and the variations with several conditions. These included that the building must comply with our radio amplification in certain buildings um, ordinance, uh, that a gate must be added to the fencing around the site to allow the fire department direct access to the pool area, um, that the engineering plans have to be approved by the village engineer and MWRD, that the petitioner should strive to save as many trees as possible and in consultation with the village forester and where replacement is necessary, replace any parkway trees with native species. <clears throat> that the deck must be made permeable by providing the adequate gapping between the boards and creating the permeable area underneath. Uh, the patio and walkway area in front of the clubhouse must be permeable pavers. That the wood composite deck and the pool deck must be reduced and or shifted north to provide the nine foot seven inch setback from the street lot line and that the fence must be set back nine feet seven inches from the street lot line. You have the ordinance um, before you that has all of those conditions outlined in it. Um, members of the swim club's team are here to answer any other questions that you have and I'm also happy to as well. Okay, so before we move on to discussion, I'd like uh, to ask for a motion to approve an ordinance approving an expansion of an existing special use permit and several variations to allow the construction of a new clubhouse as well as associated new swimming pool, sport court, and fence improvements at 100 <coughs> Blooming Bank Road, Riverside, the Riverside Swim Club. So moved. By Mr. Gallagos. Second. Second by Ms. Collins. Questions, discussion? Trustees. Mr. Pollard. Thank you. I'll go first. Uh, I, first, I want to thank the Planning and Zoning Commission. I thought they did an excellent job with a very difficult um, multifaceted petition. Uh, this is a very unique property, uh, just not only by its shape, but by, the, by its land use, its historical land use as a swim club, the only such property in the village. So based on, on those factors and the nature of the variations being requested, I was comfortable with the variations being unique and that uh, compliance with the zoning ordinance would uh, create a hardship in that it would be uh, virtually impossible or nearly impossible to redevelop the property in a reasonable manner uh, if it had to comply with all of the aspects of the uh, zoning ordinance. And of course, the special use is historical as well, and uh, that's why I don't see any issues with granting a special use. Uh, my only concern with the recommendation in the, in the plan relates to the streetscape along Blooming Bank. Uh, that's the public side, the primary public side of the property. Uh, I appreciate that the Planning Commission asked that the setback between the property line and the fence be increased from six to nine feet. I, I appreciate what they were trying to do there, but I don't agree. I think that um, whether it's six feet on the public side or nine feet on the public side, the benefit to the public is is minimal, if, if at all. 
Uh, and uh, I think what's important is that you have sufficient setback for a solid row or continuous row of landscaping shrubs, a variety of shrubs and uh, small bushes that would provide a buffer or screen between the fence and the property line. And I think six feet is more than sufficient uh, to do that. In fact, it's the right number for that type of uh, landscape row. Um, my other concern is that uh, there, are, is, there is a lot of traffic, pedestrian traffic, uh, between the public sidewalk at the uh, commuter parking lot and the entrance to the um, swim club. And it's probably 99% uh, of people going to the swim club. Uh, and right now, the swim club has a pathway for their customers, their guests, uh, members, uh, to, to be able to access the, the uh, entrance. With this change as proposed, uh, pedestrians would have to cross at least one street, if not uh, cross the street three times, uh, to get to the entrance uh, on foot uh, 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 when accessing the, the, the swim facilities. So therefore, I would like to add to the recommendation that a public sidewalk be built, a uh, five-foot wide public sidewalk in the public right-of-way uh, between the existing sidewalk uh, and the entrance to uh, the swim club. It's my understanding there's a 14-foot parkway minimum, and so with a five-foot sidewalk, you still have a nine-foot uh, parkway, which is typical uh, 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 in, in Riverside and other, other places. So, so to summarize, I am in agreement with the Planning Commission recommendation mm -hmm. and with the changes that the fence setback along Blooming Bank be reduced from nine to six feet, that a uh, continuous uh, uh, row of, of landscaping be provided between the fence and the property line, and that a five-foot sidewalk be installed in the public right-of-way to connect uh, the the uh, sidewalk uh, near the commuter lot to the entrance to the uh, swim club. Mr. Molina? Yeah. What's, what's the most efficient way to handle this? One, should we take each of these as an amendment? Each of the three items that Mr. Pollock... So mentioned? what I would think is, it's, we have a small board here, would be to just see whether there's a consensus on uh, agreeing with the plan commission's recommendation with the changes suggested by Trustee Pollock and just take a, take a head count, and then we can fashion a motion if everyone is desirous of those changes. Okay. Unless people want to discuss it further. So, so you've heard what Mr. Pollock had to say. Do you have any responses or additions to his thoughts? Mr. Hannon. Yeah, um, I guess my, first of all, want to echo what a great job that both the swim club representatives and the uh, planning and zoning board did. I had an opportunity to watch the meeting um, via video and, and, and thought everything was uh, well thought out, that the swim club uh, was prepared and ready to answer the questions and had thought through the tough issues. So that was very appreciated. You know, my concern, and I think this goes with Trustees Pollock's issue, um, would love some information on the, the privacy uh, slatting versus the, the windscreens that are up now. And I think that goes to the streetscape issues. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm not as concerned with where the setback is uh, but my concern is, you know, the street view. I think we've all become comfortable and accustomed to the windscreens. We see those at tennis courts. We see those currently at the pool. Um, I, I wasn't clear to me in watching the planning and zoning meeting what those privacy slattings look like, what they would do. And I guess my concern is I, I don't want a solid wall so close to to the parkway. Um, my second comment um, on, on Trustee Pollock's proposal to put in a sidewalk, I, I, you know, the question is who is going to, you know, pay for that. Right now it has a asphalt pathway. I'm not sure the origin of that pathway, um, but, you know, we're going to talk about all the capital improvements 
uh, that need to be done in the next few years and um, you know putting in a sidewalk to accommodate the swim club um, you know can be on that list but I, I think there's other items that may have priority if, if the expectation is that the village is going to pay for that so Ms. Zapp, can you answer that question or should we address it to the swim club representative regarding the privacy slides yes um, let's have the swim club describe that a little more if you could come up to the podium please uh, and just for clarity, clarity uh, Mr. Marhul, who is here this evening, he is a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. He did, however, uh, recuse himself from all discussion of this item at the Planning and Zoning Commission hearings. Thank you for the introduction, President Sells. The, pr the slatting that we were asking for is intended to be along the north side of the fenced area, which would be the commuter parking lot, and then also along the east side, which is the commuter parking lot. Our ask included the ornamental fence along the Blooming Bank, Blooming Bank frontage. And as Trustee Pollock suggested, we'd like to put some landscaping in front of that fence to soften it and get some element of privacy. Just but no, no slatting or uh, solid screening is intended at all for the, the Blooming Bank frontage. So the, the privacy is going to be created by the foliage on, on the Blooming Bank side? Correct. Uh, there is, there's, to, to back up slightly, on the north side there is slatting there already. Uh, it's in pretty raggedy shape, but it is there. So it's essentially uh, an existing condition. And this would add slatting to the east side facing the parking lot. And right now, my recollection is that there's windscreens there. You are correct, yes. So, what does that mean? I guess my preference would be I mean, I understand the slatting for the train track side would simply be replacing the slatting that's there. Um, you know, again, I think the, the what they've done on Blooming Bank is commendable. I'm concerned about sort of the view from the commuter lot because it is viewable, um, you know, as you walk to and from the train from the park. And I think that would be impactful of the view that you get from our train station, the park area, and, you know, walking through that. So my preference would be um, to do windscreens instead of slating just because it's more commonly recognized and consistent with what they have now. We that would be, we can do that. That's, we, since the east side and the north side were both the chain link um, for security and to prevent the kids from jumping over, we just assumed that we were gonna use the same uh, slatting on both sides. But if you prefer the, the windscreen look, that's fine. And then it comes down at the end of the season as it does now. Yeah, and, and to be clear, the train track side, I agree with you guys on the sledding. Thank you. Mr. Pollock? Yes, I apologize. I meant to bring that up in my initial comments, the, the, the issue of this uh, uh, screening. Right now, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that there is sledding or mesh on the Blooming Bank side of the swim club facility, correct? We currently use the, right. the windscreen I feel that, that everywhere. I feel there should be a mesh, uh, an opaque mesh, like the tennis court example, along Blooming Bank, not partially for the privacy of swim club members, but primarily to provide a, a screen from the public side so it's not a distraction and that um, I think having that activity there, it needs to be softened, it needs to be camouflaged a little bit with a, with a mesh on, on the Blooming Bank side. And I think if you used a black mesh on that black wrought iron fence, it would look fine, it would look good. Um, and so I would like to add that to my recommendation as well. And I'm fine with mesh on the parking lot, commuter parking lot side too. Um, so, a couple questions, um, and I think I know what that slatting would look like. Is it similar to the slatting that you see at like the RB football stadium where it intertwines in between the links? 
Yeah. Correct. So from a they, durability perspective, and, I, and frankly, aesthetically, that's probably more expensive than the, when the wind than the wind guard. It might look better on the on the, the north end and the east end. Just my personal thoughts, which don't really matter. Um, and then with regard to the ornamental fence, I think that the windscreens that are there now were not there for all that long. And I think that the investment from, from, the, from RSC's perspective, putting up an ornamental fence um, in a, with, with the landscaping on the outside would actually make it be more aesthetically pleasing, I think, to the people walking along the path with the, the sidewalk, but also in, inside, so you're not confined to four walls internally, but then also walking by. I mean, I remember as a, as a kid, riding my bike down that path and stopping and just trying to see which of my buddies were there, right? Or, or, or you know, stop your bike and you sit there and you chat with people. It was, it was actually one of the best memories of going to the pool. And I think that if we did this properly, if the, if the fence was, 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 was ornamental, I actually think that it would add something aesthetic that would be a value. Look at those bike racks outside the train station right now. And I mean, those are beautiful. I mean, I was walking by them today and I was like, oh, these are really good looking, right? Not just those typical aluminum stuff, and so I fear. I feel like if we put that mesh up there, by the time it gets ragged and it's intertwined and this and that, if, if they're willing to put up the, the 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 shrubs, gosh, I think that that would look fantastic. I mean, this is what you see in, in people's backyards, right? So, it's uh, it's nice. It, it's it's welcoming to, from my perspective. I don't know what everyone else thinks. But that's just we were we were definitely trying to improve the appearance of yeah. uh, the, the blooming bank side of the swim club by doing the ornamental fence. So. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great touch. Okay, so let's let's stay on this particular issue then yeah, with regard to the screening or windscreens or how we're going to do it, Mr. Hannon. Oh no, I was just going to comment that I uh, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Trustee Jiza on the. Um, uh, you know, not putting the, the windscreen on the iron fence and the, the, you know, landscaping would be a better, better look, assuming it has the coverage described in the presentation. Yeah. Okay, so I've, okay, now I'm lost. So what, <laughs> what is the, what is your suggestion in terms of the different sides? My last comment was to uh, express disagreement with Trustee Pollock on the need to put screens on the metal portion of the fence with French blooming bank. I would still like wind screens on the portion that fronts the parking lot, the to, to the east. The commuter lot. The commuter lot, correct. Okay, so that's the proposal right now is the basically ornamental fence and and uh, landscaping along blooming bank and wind screens on the commuter lot side. Yes. Ms. Collins. Um, could I just ask, which provides better privacy, slatting or the screening? The slatting is more solid. And uniform. And I uniform, would... but uh, we only put the, the screening up during the season. And so during the winter and the fall, then it, um, it doesn't appear as much of a, a But plot. in general, the slatting would provide less opportunity to look in. Correct. Okay, I'm in favor of the slatting because that's a parking lot. I do not want someone sitting in the parking lot watching what's going on in the swim club just for privacy purposes. So I would prefer the slatting as opposed to the screening. And the slatting will be up permanently year round, whereas the windscreens come down after the season. Okay, that's my concern. Other comments? <clears throat> I prefer the windscreen on the east perimeter. Oh, sorry, I, I, <clears throat> Yeah. I would prefer aesthetically to have the windscreening on the east perimeter of the swim club. Instead of, instead so I would, of I would agree with Trustee Hannah and Trustee Tisa that uh, that but would in, be so slatting. But she, but Ms. Collins is saying she wants the slatting instead of the windscreen. On the east side. I think the slatting will actually look better, quite frankly. If you look at RB Stadium, where they have like go bulldogs or whatever. So we've got three, three for slatting over here. How about over here? Somebody needs but to everybody, say something. Everybody's <laughs> looking at me. I'm, I'm for the windscreen. I'm for the windscreen. That's what they have up now, okay, and it's so worked for the last 30 years. How about, how about Trustee Evans and Trustee Pollock? Are we talking just on the commuter parking lot side right now? I am either way. I don't feel strongly about yeah. that either way, whether it's sliding or mesh on that side. 
I can see advantages of both. I mean, the mesh, I mean, if it's up there year round, the mesh is not going to wear as well. But on the other hand, for security purposes, when no one's there, it's nice to be able to see in. Well, only the slatting would be up year round, right? The, right. The That's what I'm saying down. is, on the commuter parking lot side, there's views from the public. There's eyes from the street that can see inside if there's trouble going on in the winter time. And if you have the slatting, you're, you're going to block that view. If you have the mesh, you can see shadows, you can see figures through it. So. I'll go with the majority of the board on that one. <laughs> so with regard to, to Ms. Collins' concerns about, I mean, she's basically trying to protect the, the users of the, peop the people inside the swim club. Is, is, the, is the windscreening opaque enough to, that you can't see through it? We've never had any complaints from our members about the use of the windscreen. I, from a distance, unless you're right up, to be honest, unless you're right up against the windscreen, it really looks fairly opaque from a distance. Um, so I think windscreen during the season when people are swimming is sufficient for our privacy purposes. Ms. Collins, is that? If, they're, if you're satisfied with that, but that would be my concern is I don't want the children being watched from the parking lot. Would it be black to sort of blend into the aluminum fence in the front? I think based on our desire to improve the aesthetics of the yeah. club, we would match the fence color, which is black. Okay, so we have consensus on that point. Um, what about the moving the setback from nine to six feet? Yeah. Any concerns about that? Or is there agreement on that? I see, I see agreement, yes. I, I, okay. okay. Um, the continuous row of landscaping along the Blooming Bank. Yes? I think they are you, agree are you, that. Is the swim club okay with that? Yes. No. And let's, leave, let's set aside the sidewalk just for a second. Because um, I had another question. If, with these changes that you've just heard, how is that going to affect, I'm a little concerned in terms of losing trees along, along Blooming Bank? We what? are scheduled to meet with Ms. Apt and the Village Forester this Tuesday, or next Tuesday, excuse me, to verify which trees are considered uh, valuable. And so um, we'll do an in or replacement as suggested by the forester to um, whatever we lose that's within, I'm sorry, I'm totally confusing myself. Could you repeat the question? I'm just concerned about the number of trees we're gonna lose and how's that, how that's gonna be addressed. Uh, thank you. Right now, with the nine foot seven setback that planning and zoning approved, any veg all of the green space that is out there right now would be retained as green space. So any trees that the village forester de deems is that should be removed and and replaced, we will do okay. with something better. Uh, I had, at one point, I had heard suggested one tree every 50 feet along that frontage. So, Mr. Millian, I have another question for you now with regard to this sidewalk issue. Um, I mean, Mr. Pollock is suggesting a public sidewalk in the public right-of-way. Correct. That would be a village expense? No. Uh, you, could re you could require the swim club to put it in as a condition of the approval. Uh, but of course, at, after it's put in, because it's in right of way, it would become the village's issue going forward. And did I understand you say it's 14 feet, Mr. Pollock? Uh, uh, staff can verify, but from the Planning Commission meeting, I believe it was stated that there's a 14 foot parkway minimum. Mr. Bailey, can you give us a ballpark cost for 14 feet of sidewalk? <laughs> well, no, excuse me. Five foot five sidewalk. Feet, five foot sidewalk by uh, 275 feet is the, the, the length of the, the swim club. So that already takes care of Mr. Pollock's concern then? I, I believe that's what he's referring to. Sidewalk entrance on the blooming. Uh, A five foot wide sidewalk, right. Right. Is, in the right that, of way? Yeah. Is that already in, in the in plan? In the public then? right of way. No. I'm sorry. No, there is no sidewalk proposed. Is this You're requesting one. The parkway 
the public parkway has enough room to accommodate a five foot sidewalk because the parkway is 14 feet deep. The length of the frontage, as they said, is about 275 feet. Oh, I see, okay. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. So with regard to, with regard, sorry, with regard to, the, to the sidewalk, um, because that land is beautiful, right? The way you curve around there, and I think with the new aluminum fence, it'll look great, and the new clubhouse. But is, would it be possible to just, in something that's ADA compliant, obviously, but to put some sort of a pathway, maybe with a similar material that's permeable, like the one stuff at Turtle Park, to kind of wind that through there, sort of following sort of like a natural. Oh, what? One thought would be that perhaps something that is pervious would be better and wind it be between whatever trees the forester determines yeah. are appropriate to keep. Um, we can do the permeable. Um, and this is at, now what I'm about to propose is at the board's discretion, obviously, but could we go with the 50-50 sidewalk replacement program and pay for it that way? Um, I don't know what the board's uh, tolerances for new sidewalks. So, Mr. Pollock, the, the asphalt path that's there, that's there now, that's what you're talking about, right? You're, you're saying to replace that with a sidewalk. Right, with a public sidewalk, exposed aggregate, five feet wide, our, our standards for a sidewalk. Um, and the reason I think it's justified to have the petitioner cover that cost is that it's for their customers, for their, their members. Uh, if you don't put it in, there'll be a cow path because people will walk that way. Um, and I think it, it's critical that, that it be put in there. And I think given everything that is being considered here, that's a, a minimal cost or minimal ask from the village to have them put in a public sidewalk. Mr. Bailey, did you have a chance to do some calculations? <laughs> uh, $27,000. Not that I want to filibuster this, but should this go before LAC at all for their approval? It's a good point. And uh, does it also have to go to preservation? Mr. Molina, does, would it also need to go to preservation? Oh, good point. It's hard, hard scale. Technically, for public improvements in the streets, it should go to preservation yeah, I, as well. I think that's a, that's a good catch. I think it, yeah, it would have to. So when I suggest this, I, I, let's, let's hammer one thing out first, though, because basically we've got Mr. Pollock saying that exposed aggregate we have another viewpoint that says it might be permeable. Permeable, of course, would be much more expensive than the sidewalk. Um, I don't know, I mean, you'd have to ask the village forester about the effect, of, but there's already an asphalt path there now. Um, given the other work that you've admirably done in terms of water retention and stormwater management, I don't see a big issue with having a pervious surface for the sidewalk. Um, so. Uh, but just to clarify, though, I'm, I'm not say, suggesting, uh, sorry, I was trying to suggest that it was more cost efficient. So I was thinking that that, that gravel, but, but if, if the like sidewalk is fine. Crushed stone. Like yeah, crushed stone, like the turtle park. Not, like not brick. I was trying to find a way to save money, not add more money. I'm not sure we could put crushed gravel in a public right of way. Don't, aren't we constrained by ADA? Yeah, there'd be, there, there could be some issues. I don't know about ADA compliance with that. I don't know. I don't think it, it would comply, but. Gentlemen, yes. We had some discussion with the architect about this, and if crushed, the crushed stone is placed appropriately with the appropriate binders and the club maintains it appropriately, it can be ADA compatible. Uh, I'd like to note that there is crushed stone in Turtle Park right now, um, and it seems to be holding up okay after a number of years. Well, so why don't I suggest this, let's, because this obviously would be something that would be done very late, probably one of the last things that would be done in the construction phase. Spring, probably spring yeah. 2021. So why don't we set this aside, let, let the swim club think about this, formulate some, a, a proposal, 
uh, and then we can go through our normal commission process, and then we can bring this single item back. Uh, but there's no reason to hold up everything else because of this one, one little item. So uh, I think we have consensus on the other items that Mr. Pollock mentioned. Yes, sir, please. I'm sorry, I have to follow up. Um, <laughs> I have to ask Director Bailey about his numbers. Um, $25 a square foot is what you said? We think $20. Because at one point, not too long ago, I believe we talked about nine dollars mm -hmm. square foot for exposed matter of fact, During the uh, Selborne Road reconstruction project, the bid price was six and a half dollars per square foot. That was part of a road reconstruction project. Uh, we frequently see lower prices when we do sidewalks with the road reconstruction project, but standalone projects, smaller quantities square foot price can be quite high. So what does the village get when we do sidewalks? What do we get for exposed aggregate sidewalk? What kind of prices does the village get when we're doing a lot of sidewalk? Well, we replace sidewalk um, just immediately to the north of the arcade building. That was $20 per square foot. So, so that's gone up a lot since the last time this board's talked about it. Yeah. It, it, even as in the aggregate, even when we're doing a thousand lineal feet and we're doing streets and we're, it's all one contract, you're saying it comes in at $20 a square foot? Right. The way that street reconstruction project worked is there was a limited amount of uh, sidewalk involved in it because it was the uh, ADA ramps at the intersections. And that bid price for that part of the project was six and a half dollars per square foot. We then went to that contractor and said, would you add more sidewalk to that at that price? The contractor agreed to as long as that uh, sidewalk was within the project area. They weren't, weren't going to go all over town. They would honor that. They didn't have to, um, but they would honor that price so long as the sidewalk was uh, in the construction area of Selborne Road, um, but we couldn't count on that. So we take advantage of those opportunities when the contractors are um, willing, I guess. That makes a big difference, obviously. It's a big, very big difference in price. Uh, one thing that maybe, and, and I'm fine with delaying this decision, provided that the swim club is committed that if we say we want it, they'll build it. Um, so that, you know, we, we know we still have the option. What I would suggest we do, possibly, if, when we do revisit it, is that we just ask them to give us a contribution and then we go out and find that good price that, uh, that we may be able to get with our village sidewalk program, where we may get it for less than $10 a square foot as opposed to 20 or 25 and then and then we build it i mean i guess the only just from an aesthetic standpoint my two cents would be that if if you're going to do the sidewalk there that it makes more sense to me to have it be exposed to aggregate so that it's in, it matches the, the rest of the village's sidewalks mm -hmm. instead of having kind of a one-off you know in that area so what do you gentlemen think about this idea uh, we're open to it yes uh, we'll talk to the village about where exactly the sidewalk should be so that we save any vegetation that the forester wants to save. And then we can work with our construction manager as well to look at the pricing and uh, timing of installation. Okay. Anything else on this side? Okay, so with, with, uh, with those conditions added, we have before us a motion to, uh, to approve this variation. Are, is there any further discussion? Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. The motion carries. And I just want to express my gratitude to the swim club. I, I, I followed this 
this process all the way through, through the many different meetings that you had with the Planning and Zoning Commission. This is really how this process is supposed to work, and the goodwill and the cooperation that you showed uh, is much appreciated. And congratulations. I look forward to seeing your new pool. Thank you. Thank we you very much. It's been a very long road, and you guys are our last hurdle, so thank you. We appreciate the discussion and your consideration. Um, as Jason said, this has been a, a long time coming, and we've been part of the community for 67 years and helped add out with the commuter parking lot and finding space for all the cars, so we want to be part of the community. Thank you thank very you. much, gentlemen. Thank you. One, oh, just one question, for Elena. Sonia, those changes to the conditions, you've got sufficient detail? I think so. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. just wanted okay. to make sure. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on now to considerations. Uh, first up is start talk about a, uh, a long process. This is the start of a long process that we go through every year heading into our budget season. Uh, we're going to start this evening with a discussion of our capital improvement plan. Uh, Director Johns, where are you? There you are. Good evening. Presented before you tonight is the Village's 10-year capital improvement span, planning years 2021 through 2030. This is the first step in our annual budget process, which will continue into our next meeting with the financial forecast, budget discussions, and eventually a budget adoption and property tax levy. Staff would like this to be an interactive discussion with the board to receive guidance on future goals and objectives that they have. The board will review the item, the item several more times before funds are actually expended during the budget adoption process and again for board approval for any item over 20000 Each department has submitted project requests to be included within the plan which are prioritized and adjusted by the village manager. Staff felt it was important to present the, the board a funded plan, so you will see a schedule of funded projects and a schedule of unfunded projects for the 2021 year. The plan presented before you includes $1,393,500 of projects for fiscal year 2020, which are which represent approximately 441,000 to be funded by the water and sewer fund, 358,000 by the motor fuel tax fund, and about 25,000 from the, the, all business districts. The remainder would be in um, unassigned fund balance. To begin to, tonight's discussion, I would like to see if there's any feedback or additional information requ requested on the list of funded projects starting on page 203. Sorry, 202. So the funded projects are 202 through 206, and then the unfunded are uh, 207 through 210. Are there any? items on the funded list that any trustee thinks should not be? Or do you have any questions about any of the items that are on the list? I'm sorry, can you clarify? I, I printed this and do not have page numbers, so what's at the top of? It's the capital expense progression, fiscal year 2021. Okay. The it starts with, um, Administration and finance subtotal. Server okay. replacement is the first and, item. And these are the funded? These are the funded. So let me, just as a matter of clarification, because I had this question today uh, when I spoke with Ms. Jones and Ms. Francis about this, you'll, you'll notice, for example, on underneath the, uh, the police, there's a patrol vehicle for $64,000. And then on the unfunded, you'll see that there are two other patrol vehicles, each for $64,000. And that's because there were three originally desired, but there's only funding for one. So that's not a, it's not a repetitive. Same thing with the cameras. Uh, the, the desire was 40,000. There's only 20,000 funded. But, Please. 
right below those two items, uh, we have the replacement of patrol rifles. Um, mm -hmm. And is that already funded or is that to be funded? I'm, I'm confused as to what The patrol we're... rifles? Yes. Uh, that's, that's on the funded list. Um, I, I guess my question is, I think, you know, replacing the very old uh, police vehicles and accelerating the surveillance cameras, which, you know, I think we've all read and been informed on the tremendous benefit that those surveillance cameras have done. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to explore, is there a way to, you know, reduce that amount, amount on the patrol rifles and, and would love to get the input from Chief Weitzel on, you know, actual uses of, of you know, patrol rifles or whatever the uh, replacement would be versus the tremendous benefits if we could move that reduction to the surveillance program and make it a higher priority. I had, I had exactly the same thoughts. So, Mr. Weitzel, would you like to address that? In yeah, reference to the, uh, our first, good evening, President Sells, Trustees, uh, Manager Francis. The patrol rifles um, are 18 years old. They are functioning. They're, it's not that they're broke. Um, there really isn't parts for them, but what I mean by that is we can send them back to Colt, that's the manufacturer, and they could, they'd have to rebore them, they'd have to uh, mill them. It, they, these rifles might need new, some of them need new barrels, um, some equipment. But we do, have, we do have patrol rifles that are functioning. So to be able to either defer that and move that to another higher project, whether that be a squad car or a uh, more funded for the street camera program, um, I would not be opposed. But I would say that maybe I could replace one or two patrol rifles, or if I would put it back in the CIP budget for the following year, I would maybe come back to the manager with a with a progression of not replacing them all at once, just a, a, a less a less financial burden. President Sells, if I could please ask a, I guess I'm, you know, following on on our last meeting uh, with, with with the police department, which was well done. If you could walk me through sort of the the, the purpose of having, you know, the long rifles or the replacement rifles or whatever we're going to get. I mean, I, in my mind, you know, I'm not coming up with a realistic scenario on when a rifle would have to be presented, let alone fired. Yeah, so the patrol rifles are, uh, we switched over 20 years ago from pump shotguns to patrol rifles. And the main uh, focus behind that was that the patrol rifles were easier to use, um, they're easier for our officers to qualify, they're modern, and our insurance carrier at, um, was in support of um, equipment for liability reasons that we would update. But you, you take into consideration that we have a primary responsibility for Riverside Brookfield High School. And we, those patrol rifles, unfortunately, would be used there if we had a school shooter, no question. My officers would be first on scene. We would be able to get an uh, emergency response team or a SWAT team, but it would probably take an hour to an hour, an hour and, or 90 minutes for them to uh, assemble at the school and be there. So the patrol rifles are for those types of events. We have pulled them before. We've never fired those patrol rifles in the line of duty ever. But that's really the fact that we have five grade schools. If you take into the Catholic grade school, is that six? And the high school, um, that's one reason that we switched over to the rifle many years ago from the shotgun. And that's a purpose that I think is justified for patrol rifles, is school safety. That was helpful. Thank you. Excuse me. How, how many are there? How many are we talking? There's currently eight. So about 5,000 per rifle? Yes, and this budget item that I gave the manager and the finance director, I want, included everything. So there's ammunition there. So you, some, you know, years past we might have put ammunition in another. So this is a total cost of the weapon and the ammunition for those weapons. So if we space this out over years, so it would be like increments of five. Yeah, and if we wanted to space it out through years, I would come back in the, to the manager at the next budget time and the finance director with a plan for maybe two a year, okay. three a year, something that okay. may, maybe could be more um, acceptable. Okay. Would, 
would, would, would shifting those fees to the surveillance make a meaningful difference in the surveillance program and its benefits? Um, I'm very supportive of the, sa the surveillance program, I think, has been very successful, the public cameras. Um, as you know, we had our, we, those are all our cameras, but we've actually partnered with some private businesses too. The areas that I would still like to see covered um, would be Harlem and Burlington area, Harlem and Long Common. They might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, I'd have to do a little bit more work on those because the electric there right now is owned by IDOT. But I'd also like to see maybe our public parking lot where the commuters park in lot one. There's no cameras. And there's that walkway between the train station and the commuter lot. I think that would be a real easy fit because when we put in the cameras at the train station, they put in all the cabling. So that, that camera that could go there would be a minimal expense because uh, all they have to do is, retro, is put a camera there. All the, all the hard work, electric and cabling is already done. Yeah. So um, I had asked for 40. Um, we settled on 20 or the manager center on 20 with the finance director. But that would still get us a, a significant amount of street cameras probably five to seven thousand dollars a camera with full installation so with the with the full 40 that you asked for would you be able to cover all the areas that you just mentioned yeah i believe uh, depending if we could get a partnership maybe with berwin and the reason i mentioned that so the berwin library at harlem and uh, harlem and long common they have the same system we have for our street cameras the same company griffin systems the same cameras so I had at one time reached out to the Berwyn superintendent and the library director to see if we could use their infrastructure to mount on their side to cover our area of Harlem and Long Common. And at that time, that was a couple of years ago, they were open to that idea. So I, I do believe there's even some cost savings. So I think $40,000 would cover the program significantly, yes. I, I mean, I'd be in favor of, of rather than buying the eight replacement rifles by four this year, four next year, and take that 20,000 of savings and, and increasing the surveillance cameras from 20 to 40. Mr. Paul? I, I agree that the uh, surveillance cameras are top priority or very high priority, uh, whether it comes from reducing the, the, uh, the, the, the rifles or not. I, I yeah, would look for staff to make a recommendation in that regard, but uh, definitely I couldn't agree more that the cameras, we need to maximize what we can do uh, with the cameras. So just to follow up on that, I mean, I was, I was having exactly the same thoughts, um, and, and especially going through your, your memorandum with regard to the morale of your force, my suggestion would be to, uh, <coughs> to defer the the patrol rifles all together for this year and you know do the forty thousand dollars on the surveillance cameras and then do also do the paint upgrade because as you noted in your memo um, that would be to paint the interior of the police facility lobby stairs stairways upper and lower levels i think all of us know the effect the psychological effect a nice fresh coat of paint can have on the facility um, and then you know leave the other ten thousand in the general fund uh, and then, as Chief said, he can come back next year and propose some kind of rollout for the. If the I, I, I understand the hypothetical that you pose, but uh, we have we have working weapons. The, the weapons we have are functional, and given the extreme unlikely event that you just mentioned, you know, do we need to be spending twenty thousand dollars on new weaponry? That's that's my concern, Mr. Hanna. I would I would disagree with a full deferral. I would hate to sit here uh, as a board and have an unfortunate incident with the comment that uh, our police force was undergunned in a crisis situation because we wanted to paint walls. So I, I would disagree with that. I'd like to buy half the rifles this year, half the rifles next year, and uh, use that savings for the surveillance, which is sort of goes towards the public. Uh, safety element that the chief has explained to us in a number of years. I just what what, what caliber weapon is is the are the current patrol rifles? They're they're AR-15s. Um, those are patrol rifles. Um, they're what I think about every law enforcement agency carries that purchases rifles for the patrol division. 
so in terms of being outgunned, there, we would have the same caliber weapon, new or used, right? Uh, there are there are there are offenders that have been documented to use AR-15s in mass shootings. That's correct. And no, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. So the the weapons we have now are 223, 223 caliber, I assume, and that's what the new weapons would be. Yeah, they'd be they'd be we'd be re, we'd be replacing the current ones with uh, modern AR-15s. That's correct. So. Uh, in terms of, it, I mean, it would be the same firepower. Right. Now, to your point, I mean, if you want, you know, a, maybe a compromise would be leave, take, take the 10,000 that's left and buy two, two new rifles. And then going back to what Ms. Collins said, you know, replace these rifles over, over time. Is there a value to the, to the old rifles? Is there a trade in value? Or do you have to decommission them? Uh, well, being a law enforcement agency, we have to decommission. We're not allowed to sell them unless, unless the manufacturer would take them back from us. Hmm. Mr. Hand, what do you think of that idea? I, I'd like to go half and half. I mean, I, I, I think that if, you know, you, you get a point where, uh, and, and Chief, please correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, if there wasn't a need to replace these rifles, I, I don't think they would have been on the, the funded budget to begin with. Um, I, I, you know, going from eight to four is, is uh, you know, uncomfortable. Going from eight to two, um, uh, you know, like I said, I'd, I'd like these fully funded in two years if we could. Other thoughts? Ben? I would also like to have half and half as well. What is the life cycle of these? Could we put them on a rotating where they're just, you know, like we've done with some of, um, the, main, the landscaping equipment where it's just a, a, you know, every year we do whatever, or every three years we do whatever. What's the lifespan? Yeah, I would talk to my armor, who's uh, Sergeant Leo Coder, but yes, they, they could be put on a, uh, like a rotation cycle, but it, it would be significant. It wouldn't be like, I mean, we, they could, it could be 15 years as long as that to where they- you, So if it was 15 years, every two years we replace one? <clears throat> yes. So I'd rather see something like that so that we don't come up with a big payout needed at one time. I'm fine with doing two a year, unless you're saying that these are not functioning now or you have a concern about these right now. They are functioning. They're, they're, it's not that they're not functioning. They're just getting old. Um, so I, I believe it's time to start replacing them. Are you That's comfortable with two of them being replaced or do you feel that it needs to be more? I'm comfortable with two of them being replaced. I would be. I would. I would say that I'd be back in front of the manager and the finance director next year, asking them to replace two more. Right. To do that. That's yes. what I'm thinking. Is that if we put it on every year, we're replacing yeah, two. Yeah, and, and I'm and not saying they would grant that. I'm just saying that I. That's the. That's where I would be with and that. And then once yes. we get them all replaced, then we put them on a two-year schedule, of so that it's an ongoing issue, so that we have up-to-date equipment at all times. So. But it sounds like, based on what Chief Weitzel said, that he'd prefer more. So if we did either a 50-50, I mean, I'd rather move something like the wayfinding signs in order to protect the schools. If you think that that's what we need, then I'm not an expert on it. I've never shot a gun. But, but if you think we need them in case of an emergency, it would just be a tragedy if something did happen. You, know, you never expect something bad like that to happen until it does. I'm, I'm OK with the restarting the Replace, I mean, my personal choice would be to replace them, but the two year or two starting and then going forward, yes. Um, I guess that I take the perspective as the police chief of worst case scenarios. The, the president is right. We have never used them. Um, we've only trained with them. We only qualify with them. But the day comes that we need them. We have them. They're in the police cars for the officers that respond. And I brought up the high school and the schools because that's most likely where they would be used. Is that it? Uh, yeah. Um, just school shootings is something that um, I think about a lot. I, I, can you? I'm sorry. Sure. Sorry. I think that um, every parent, especially at the high school level, is concerned about school shootings. And so um, I do appreciate the uh, concerns that the chief is expressing, wanting to have reliable patrol rifles, um, and I think I'm just comfortable with his, 
his recommendation, if he thinks that we need eight patrol rifles, then um, we could try to give him that many or at least half versus two a year. Are you comfortable that with the rifles that you have now um, that you would have enough um, to address the school shooting? Yes, I mean, if we, if we got into the two a year, I would be comfortable because quite frankly, the two that the board would, if the board approved two tonight, when we purchased those, I, one would go in the supervisor's car and one would go on a day shift and those cars would always be going to the high school and those cars would always be going to the grade school. And then um, the other ones, like I said, are functioning, so I would be comfortable with that. So if there is a school shooting, how many police would you send? Everyone that's working and you could be assured that our neighbors would be there too. And um, I know that our neighbors have <coughs> patrol rifles too. Um, to what extent, I don't know you know, how they staff theirs, but they're meant to be in the patrol cars. That's what they're designed for. Um, but if there were three officers working days, they'd all be going. If I had four officers working days, which would be unusual, they would all be there. So, um, so you need at least four working. Well, I would, I would have, there could be as many four squad cars on the street mm -hmm. when I'm fully staffed. So could we make sure they have four really new ones? So the, I think that proposal is, sounds like there might be more consensus for that. So uh, 20,000 for the patrol rifles and then the other 20,000 will go to the cameras. Mm -hmm. Is that agreeable? Yes. Yeah. Yes? Yes. So just for clarification, I have increased the surveillance cameras from 20,000 to 40,000. I have reduced the patrol rifles from 40,000 to 20,000. Correct. And I have added in the 2022 line item another 20,000 for patrol rifles. Correct. Okay. Any other comments on the either the the funded or unfunded items before we go to the issue. Is the painting off the table then? I'm sorry? Is the painting off the table then? Um, it's off the table unless you want to put it on the table. Right now it's What was the cost of that? 15. 15? 15,000. Yeah. Not if we do the other, no. Okay, so let's turn, did, did you have, did you want to? Just one quick comment about the unfunded. Um, I wanted to mention that there are several um, large projects in that unfunded that we have discussed before, including m municipal facilities repair, a fire pumper truck, and Kent Alley resurfacing. Yeah, let's, let's, let's start talking about some of the mini gorillas in our room. <laughs> so uh, looking at page 198, uh, at the top of the page, it says issues to consider. So, actually, where was the? I just want to add one more page. Let me go to page number for you. So, as we look, as we look down the not so distant future, you see, you see on page. 198 that we have a need for over $3 million worth of fire department vehicles. Uh, if you look at page 250, you will see a, a cost analysis coming out of our, of the, the sewer study that we did in 2014. Um, the cost there is basically 9 million six. That's from 2014. Uh, you can assume that that cost is going to be s several million dollars more than that now, uh, six years later. So it, just in those two items alone, you know, we're probably looking at close to 15 million dollars or so of expenditures that are going to be required. So. If you look at the, at the various things that the staff is asking us for direction on, they basically have different ways of paying for different things. 
with regard to the, the, the fire needs, they have a suggestion that you can pay as you go, which we can't because there's no pay as we go, to pay as we go. Uh, we, could, we could have a, a referendum, a general obligation tax debt, <coughs> uh, use of a limited tax debt, or we could actually try to increase the general property tax, um, all of which are problematic to say the least. With regard to the, the storm sewer problem, the, there has been new data that has just been released, a form called Bulletin 75, that basically says that the, the rate, the, the overall rain that we're going to get in the coming years is going to significantly increase, and the intensity of individual rain events is going to increase. So all of the, in our recent memory, all of the basement flooding that we experienced with this past year's flooding uh, is going to continue to occur more commonly. It's not going away. So my personal thought is what we need to do is, is task our staff with, with the following idea. We know that we have these multi-million dollar projects that we're going to need over the coming years. We do have the possibility of rolling some bonds over. So we have the street bonds, we also have the public works bonds. That you want to you want to just outline some of that, either okay. you or Ms. Johns, whichever. I'll start, okay. and then she can fill in some of the blanks. So we have the street bonds that were issued approximately five years ago. Prior to that. 15 years ago, we went to voters, so with those, we would have to go to the voters again in five years. Um, so the board would need to start working on rolling over those, essentially, in about three and a half to four years to make sure we have the referendum question, all of that filed, and that whole process <coughs> completed. So that's one piece. Um, that There would be no change in property tax bills because it's been on the property tax bills for the past 15 years. We've held the line on that so you wouldn't see a difference or there wouldn't be any net impact on residents. So that's one item, which we've done, like I said, we've done it twice now with the street bonds. The other option is your limited tax debt. We utilized our limited tax debt, which we don't have to go to referendum for and we don't have to go to the voters for. Um, that is bonds and debt that we can issue on our own without um, going to the voters. The board approves it and designates what those monies are going to be utilized for. We've utilized it for the past 20 years, essentially, for the public paying off the public works facility debt. That will be paid off. We have one more installment to be paid from the limited tax debt. Um, we did issue those remaining bonds for the resurfacing of Selborne, which was done. So those will be repaid over the next three and a half years. Once that comes off, we have approximately 1.5 million to utilize for capital in the future. Then you have your water and sewer fund, which has, you can issue alternate revenue debt. What does that mean? That means that debt is being paid for by user fees because that is an enterprise fund. So that should be totally self-sufficient. We have certain debt that we've issued in the past for water and sewer fund that will be dropping off. So really what we need to start putting together long-term are these strategies for how we're going to approach funding our capital. Um, so with looking at, we'll take the fire vehicles, for example, you have to remember that there's significant cost savings for residents with having a part-time fire department. A full-time fire department would cost double what we pay currently. Um, and so looking at whether or not it would be palatable for residents over a 20-year span of time to pay for a general obligation bond, so you'd have to go to the voters and ask them to issue approximately $3.2 million in debt uh, to then purchase these vehicles. Pay it, then it would be those that live in Riverside would be paying for those vehicles over the 20 years in which they reside. Many communities do these types of general obligation debt. LaGrange Park did it for their fire vehicles because the residents that are getting the benefit of those vehicles are paying for it. Um, 
I think I've gone through all of, and then Director Johns, if you want to go through the options as it relates to increasing the tax rate specifically for police and fire. The board does have an opportunity if they wanted to go to the voters to increase the tax rate um, to fund these on an ongoing basis. Um, if the board is interested in that, I would recommend preparing the cost per household of what it would be to issue the debt over 20 years versus the increase of the tax rate um, to see how that really compares. Um, the increase of the tax rate is a long-term solution. Um, the, in, the referendum debt is a one-time solution and 20 years from now when we need to replace these vehicles again, um, we may be stuck in the same financial situation. Okay, so to try to draw this issue then. So, I mean, I just made some notes here. So, you know, we're looking at, I think we owe it, this is my personal opinion. I think we owe it to our residents to put forward a comprehensive scheduled plan to solve our sewer issue. Uh, the, what we experienced this past year, in, in my view, is unacceptable for our residents with the degree of, of, of basement flooding uh, that we've had, and it's just gonna get worse. So I think it's important for us to, we can update these numbers. We have a very talented group at Public Works that can update the numbers for how much the, this plan would actually cost. Uh, so we've got that, we have the fire trucks, as we just heard, could be a general obligation referendum. We have the out, you know, the still hanging out there, the whole issue of our public safety facilities that are decrepit. Um, I mean, we're getting ready, you're talking about spending $250,000 on, on roofs because, you know, they're, they're insufficient. And we have the lingering problem of the water tower. You know, one, one issue that we're, that's, uh, that's in these documents is to try to find out just exactly how much it was gonna cost to repair the water tower because of the painting issues. So these are multi-million dollar obligations that we're facing as a village. But we've, we have, we've heard some creative options here. So one thing, the next step that I, I think we could do is have our staff put together both a timeline that shows when these expenditures need to be made, and then a timeline that shows when these various revenue sources come available. So then we can see where the holes are in our, in our funding needs. Uh, because on top of everything that I just said, we also have our ongoing year-to-year -year capital improvement needs for which there is no funding source. I mean, the last, the last decade or so, we have had the luxury of having an unassigned fund balance that had been built up over many, many years uh, that we've been using for our capital improvement plans. Uh, that's, that, the, that has come to an end. You know, once we do it this year, we're not gonna have the kind of fund balance, unassigned fund balance we're gonna need to address those issues going forward. So this is, you know, this, we're, we're really, really kind of reaching a point that we always knew we were going to get to. So what staff needs from us, if I, tell me if I'm correct, is an okay to perform that analysis. The thing that I think would be very helpful is, is there, is the board amenable for us doing the analysis of looking at including the general obligation bonds or would you prefer more of the increase in the tax rate or would you like to see both? I think it would be prudent to see both, but, but I guess we would like to know whether or not there, um, that the board feels more strongly towards one item versus another. I'll address that to the trustees. Yeah, I would like to see both just because I'm not real familiar with um, what the effect would be with the general obligation bonds, so I'd like to see that as well. I'm also in favor of both as well. Not that I want to make you work harder and longer, but we got, we, we got to do our due diligence. Mm -hmm. Both, for sure. Okay. We're here. Both. Both. I think there's very little appetite for a, a current tax increase as opposed to um, replacing paid off debt with new debt. Um, so there would not be a net tax effect, but I think it's important to see both. So you, unless there's a dramatic savings 
from the current tax approach, I mean, I, I, I don't think anyone wants to increase uh, the cost of living in Riverside. And as, and as part of that analysis with regard to the sewer separation and stormwater management, that could also be funded by alternative revenue bonds, right? Right, and that would be my recommendation. We shouldn't issue general obligation bonds or go to voters with regard to that specific piece because that should be paid out of fees that we're collecting okay. from the water and sewer fund. But involved in that discussion in additional um, debt in alternative revenue source debt for the water and sewer fund is we need to make sure our revenues coming in are there to pay for it. So there may be a rec corresponding recommending increase in utility fees. And, with, and, with, and this, this is, of course, is part of the, the analysis that would have to be done with it with regard to this, the sewer issue. Um, we would also have to make sure that it was scheduled in such a way that we could blend our road construction and resurfacing it at the same time. So we need to make sure we have enough funding to do that at the same time. Right, so um, Director Bailey, Superintendent Tab, and um, our engineer, uh, Ryan Gailey, worked on, actually, these are some revised numbers, and what they did was incorporate estimated roadway costs as well. So what we did was we sat down and we spoke with the engineer about the different priorities, and then also resurfacing schedules in addition to and Superintendent Tab would be much more knowledgeable on this, but also different water main that needs to be enhanced. Because obviously our goal has always been, if we're gonna touch a road, let's take care of everything that's below it, so that once it's resurfaced, we don't have to come back to that street other, for, other than for resurfacing again in 20 years. So assuming for the sake of argument that 2021 is taken care of, how long would staff need to do this analysis and bring it back to the board? The, um, this our, global, this kind our, of global. Well, our engineer said that our plan, as it was outlined in 2015, or 2014 rather, is still a very valid plan. Um, there aren't new technologies out there that could be enhanced and things of that sort. So as it relates to this, it would be engaging our engineer to do additional um, investigative work because similar to when we did first division there were some items that were unanticipated that weren't necessarily documented um, within our historical documents with regard to the sewer um, so we would want to do some significant due diligence before we embarked on the Olmstead sewer separation project just to make sure that we don't encounter those challenges um, so it would be figuring out, first of all, looking at our debt schedule, what is our capacity to issue alternate revenue debt, and then next year, if we were to go down this path of saying that these are the priorities and let's figure out a schedule moving forward, we would, my recommendation would be um, to get a proposal from Burke Engineering for them to do their due diligence in 2021 to provide updates to these numbers because really by doing that due diligence, we'll know then the estimated costs and presumably they will probably go up because they will probably encounter similar challenges that they did within the first division. And not only those kind of challenges, but as you note in the memoranda, our, the in construction inflation is four to 10% a year. Correct. And this, these are 2014 numbers that we're looking at. So, um, so with regard to that general idea of having this kind of global financial schedule produced, what are your, are you, are you okay with that, of having this done? I don't really see any other way of doing it. I have to. Um, so that's a big, big question. Now let's go through the items to consider and see if we've if we've missed anything in here director johns um dealt with i think we've dealt with everything on page 198 i'm sorry for number one i just wanted to touch on this real quick in years past we have at the end of the fiscal year done a recommended a transfer from the general fund to fund all capital projects 
we're recommending to do this more as a project by project approval transfer for 2021 due to the uncertainty with what's going on in the economy and the possibility of having to further reduce capital expenditures. Is the board okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Page 199. I guess the only issue here that we need to address is number seven. Is that right, Ms. Johns, the water meter replacement program? Do you want to talk a little um, bit about that? If I could, sorry, go back real quick to number four. We didn't really discuss, we touched on fire vehicles. We didn't um, touch too much on park improvements. Um, there are no current park improvements scheduled for 2021, and the park improvements are really funded by any program surpluses for the next several years. That will be include paying back the general fund for improvements at Quincy Street. Um, so including um, kind of those ideas in funding mechanism conversations, I will say um, also the Parks and Rec Board has, create, has started the process of a fundraising Friends of the Parks, um, which may help offset those. Um, they also have the use of the special recreation tax levy. Um, if the board would like to use that for capital improvements related to parks. Um, currently at 43 Quincy, there is an opportunity to use special recreation tax levy money for some of the ADA improvements in that facility. I wanted to gauge the board's comfort level with using the, recre the special recreation levy for capital improvement costs as well as memberships to WSSRA. So this is a levy that's already collected. This is an uncapped levy, um, which is currently collected. It is currently what? It is currently collected. We levy it at approximately 80000 a year, which is our full cost of West Rim membership. So you're suggesting raising the levy? Yes. By what amount? We can raise it um, up to 40, an extra $40,000 a year approximately if you wanted to collect that money for capital improvements in the parks for ADA purposes. So to back up just a second, with, and I understand that the pandemic has changed much of this, but with regard to the 40 Quincy, programming will eventually pay for that. Yes, um, the surpluses in programming pay for their capital costs they, they didn't have enough in their fund balance, so when we originally discussed this, we also discussed um, repaying back the general fund for that um, so they could continue to use that repaying of the general fund for those, or they could levy special recreation dollars to pay for some of those improvements. I don't recall that as being part of what we discussed when we agreed to buy this property. I, I, I love the last part. I don't, remember, I don't remember us talking about increasing the tax levy in order to pay for 43 Quincy. We have not discussed the use of special recreation funds for capital improvements in the parks or facilities at, yet. So really the question then would be whether we want to increase the special recreation tax levy for capital improvements in the parks. And park facilities. Okay. Any discussion about that? Please. Yes. Um, I would like to see some movement in the direction of um, building our the structures, um, it, more inclusive structures. So in recent years, we've taken steps to expand our programming offerings um, for, um, what, you know, as far as like WASRA. And um, I know that we've pushed the cost on to the residents to pay for that. Um, but if there's any way for us to be a little bit more intentional um, as far as uh, planning um, some infrastructure or structural changes to the parks that um, makes it 
makes you know the playgrounds or um, any of the structures more friendly to all all children of all abilities. We uh, we actually have added components over the years. Right now, the uh, the current structure only allows for uh, replacement or repairs as opposed to reno complete renovations of playgrounds. Mm -hmm. But we have added uh, ADA pieces of equipment uh, as we've updated. But certainly I agree with a focus and uh, now that we're partners with WSSRA, I think it makes uh, more sense that if we're going to make improvements to the park, that would include recreational opportunities for everyone and certainly with the Quincy building, we have the opportunity to do more special recreation programming in that building as well. Mm -hmm. I think they would appreciate more um, space, play space outside, um, or structures, outside structural improvement. Um, like I said, we have improved our programming offerings and we will be improving our programming offerings. I just wanted to extend it now to some of our outdoor spaces. Absolutely. Mr. Yeah, just, just so I'm clear on the increase the tax versus not increase the tax, is this just a timing issue where we're anticipating the excess fees received by Parks and Rec in the future would be available to you know, make these in, in improvements, make the ADA or am I hearing that the wrong way, that we need both? It's an additional funding source. Currently, the excess in the program fees on a regular basis um, pays for capital park maintenance, um, which is replacing a slide if it's broken. It's doing small incremental changes. Um, so as an additional funding source um, for future park improvements, the special recreation levy can be used to help offset some of those ADA capital costs. Yeah, I, I, I just don't think this is the time to be raising taxes. I didn't hear that, Mr. Hanson. I, I, I don't think now is the time, given the uncertainty of what we have in the economy, is the, is the time to be raising taxes. I mean, I, I think if there's a way to, um, you know, in, increase the excess of the fees <coughs> over cost to fund it, um, but, you know, I, I think you know, looking at what we may be staring down the barrel of is just a general budget discussion. Um, like I said, there's a lot of priorities, there's a lot of unknowns, and I'm very uncomfortable with, with a tax increase pegged towards parks and recs with everything else we may have coming down the pipeline. Well, my concern is, is that we don't, we don't have anything actually in front of us. I mean, if, in order for us to talk about what, the, you know, what kind of funding source we need, we need to know what it is we're buying. And at this point, we don't have that. I mean, if the, I guess the, the, the broader policy question for the board, and please, Mr. Malchiotti and Ms. Johnson, correct me if I'm wrong, is do you want Parks and Rec to start putting together some kind of proposal for an expanded infrastructure improvement of our, of our parks and our playground equipment? Is, is that the first step? That is part of it, um, and also just the comfort of using that special recreation levy for something other than membership fees. But again, we really can't talk about that until we know what we're talking about. Right now, this is just nebulous. I mean, nobody is saying, well, let's build a new playground here, mm -hmm. or let's put, let's put this kind of new equipment in this playground over here. I mean, that would be the analysis that needs to be done first. Is that, is that right? Yes, uh, to have the most minimal effect on the, the resident, um, what other communities and other park districts do is they might levy an extra 5,000 a year and let that fund balance build up until they have a project that they can fund with it. Um, in regards to 43 Quincy, the opportunity to pay for some of the ADA improvements for the bathrooms would be a specific example of what funding could be used for. I mean, this to me sounds like a perfect opportunity for the Parks and Recreation Board. I mean, the Parks and Recreation Board is designed to be the conduit between our residents and the department, the professional staff at the department. It seems to me that this could be an analysis that the Parks and Recreation Board could do <coughs> in conjunction with the department and, and actually 
let's reach out to our residents and find out if there's a desire and a need for this and what exactly are we talking about and then once we have something in front of us then we can talk about how we might conceivably pay for it what are your thoughts on that seems appropriate yes okay okay so why don't we why don't we ask the parks and recreation board to delve into this and then come back to us okay so now moving on to number seven do you want to tell us about the water replacement program water meter replacement program originally the water replacement the water meter replacement program was scheduled for 2021 this was deferred um, due to the um, approval of the cellular tower and COVID-19 with um, the desire not to enter residents' homes to install new water meters. Based on this, we also deferred it from 2021 to 2022, but we wanted to start the philosophical discussion of how to pay for this program. Um, the last time a water replacement was, <coughs> meter replacement was done, the entire cost of the new meter and MXU was born on the resident. Um, at the onset, they were offered a, um, they had the option to pay the meter cost in full or to spread it out in a payment plan over six to 12 months. Um, we wanted to gauge the, to present a couple options, including um, the resident pays full of cost for the equipment with either a 12 month or a 24 month repayment schedule offered, the, uh, the use of infrastructure fees to pay for half of it by the village with those fees and the other half with the resident, um, or to possibly subsidize the entire amount with the infrastructure fee. Thoughts? So this has a cost of $220 in 2015. Are we anticipating a similar cost? Mr. Tapp? We haven't decided on a manufacturer for meters yet, but the cost would be dependent on the size of your meter. Smaller meters, five base meters, they would be in the, probably the low twos, if you have a up to a one inch meter, and some people have sprinkler meters that are Inch and a half meters, um, it would go, it would go up from there. So it's based on the size of meter you have. So these meters were replaced in 2015, correct? 2004 they started between 2000. I'm sorry, that is a typo. It was 2005. Oh, yeah, they, we started in 2004. They continued through 2006. Okay, all right. That was. Yep. I was like, why are we doing it again five years later? Yes. Thank I apologize. You. So, what are your thoughts on how to? pay for this. Mr. Pollock? Well, I would not want to take the option that includes um, delaying other water and sewer fund projects. We have to continue to maintain the infrastructure. I'm more inclined to just directly bill the uh, consumer, the, the residents who, who are using the water and need the water mains or water meters. Did we, did we offer a payment plan uh, back in 2005? We offered either a six month or a 12 month. Hmm. <clears throat> We'd offer that this time as well, correct? Or we could extend it to up to 24 months. Four. Okay. So this, this isn't gonna be done until 2022, right? Correct. So I, I think I'm sensing that the consensus would be some kind of payment plan for the residents, whether it's 12 or 24 months. And that decision can be made, I think, once we have, we have hard numbers to see what, you know, what would be the best impact, the least impact for the residents. Okay. I have two additional items to consider that weren't originally in the plan, um, but that were brought up. Is My next one is 
Would the board like to do any additional capital economic incentive programs in 2021? What does that mean? Director Apt? Is that the facade improvement program? It could be in addition to the facade improvement program. Correct. So just trying to think about how. Can you get a little closer to the mic? Sorry. Figuring out how we can support our businesses um, kind of through the time that we're in. What sort of additional measures can we take to help them out? Um, whether that be trying to do additional advertising. It could be um, just from a policy level, extending our outdoor dining um, further. Typically, outdoor dining is supposed to end in November if we want to allow them to continue to have additional outdoor dining for our restaurants. Um, how can we accommodate that? Could we help support or subsidize the cost for tents or things like that that would be um, allow them to have that additional capacity that would be taken away from them once the weather um, takes a turn. Um, other things we can look at is if we want to look at waiving licensing fees again, reducing licensing fees for next year as we kind of work through this phase four till, you know, till we're out of this pandemic and have a vaccine. I mean, those are all, those are all, those are all worthwhile ideas, but we don't have anything specific. You're not asking, we don't have anything specific to ask the board to consider at this point, right? I mean, the first. Not at this time. <clears throat> but we're, I think we're open to considering those yeah. kind of programs, depending yeah. on the cost and the... Um, yeah. I was going to suggest that maybe we kick this over to EDC, let them see what needs they have, and then they come back to us with a, with a list of things and how they would work. I mean, the first thought I had was, of course, a facade improvement program, but, you know, I know that worked out very well in the past. Maybe EDC sees a need for that this year and other stuff, so... I'd like to get it over to them and, and then come back to us. I would recommend that, and I think that's perfectly acceptable, what Trustee Galagos is recommending. Um, whatever incentive or program that you're looking at, I would say it could not be paid. Like we did certain things out of the general fund this year and it was absorbed. We don't have the capacity in 2021 to do that. So it would have to come out of capital projects mm -hmm. or that unassigned fund balance. So. And yeah, you know, under normal circumstances, I would agree with the idea of, you know, of involving the EDC. But I mean, given that it's you know, September and some of these things that Ms. App was just talking about, these are decisions that might have to be made in the next few weeks. Okay, you so know, time is start, as, not yeah, on so our I, side. I would suggest that we just interact, have our have our professional staff interact with the businesses and see what they need. And, and to Manager Francis's point, you know, <coughs> there's, there's only so much blood in this turnip, you know? Yeah. Um, so see what they need and see if there's some way that we can assist them. You had something else, Director Johnson? Not included in our current funding is the balances we hold at NSEBC and IRMA. Um, that's always an annual kind of point that if the board wanted to remove those funds to use for either operational offsets or additional capital, we could look at removing those funds. Currently, the return that we're getting at IRMA is excellent. Um, better than our own investment opportunities. Yeah, I, I would recommend not touching those. That is our <laughs> ultimate rainy day fund. Is that a agree <clears throat> on that? Not quite running hard enough yet. <laughs> exactly, it's not running hard enough yet. <laughs> An alternative option that Director Johns and I were discussing this afternoon is the balance at our benefits co-op, which is NSEBC, um, was just a deposit that we transferred over from our previous benefits pool, and it does not accumulate any interest. So our discussion was looking at utilizing that and crediting it over to our IRMA account then in 2021 so we can start accumulating interest on that balance. Agreement? Yes, okay. So the only outstanding thing I guess is in terms of the big ticket items, and I don't know what there is to talk about this, is, is the Kent, Lincoln, and Selborne Alley reconstruction. Um, 
that, that is funded by non-home rule sales tax and motor fuel tax, right? Currently, it was in the budget for non-home rule sales tax. Um, there isn't a balance in non-home rule sales tax um, at this time. So I also noticed in the, the map, there aren't any road improvements scheduled for 2021 for the same reason. We basically are tapped out after Selborne, right? Correct, especially in non-home rule sales tax. In the MFT fund, there are a myriad of projects that we are still awaiting final billing from the state on, which can take several years, um, but we are waiting for bills for um, the metro intersection improvements, the um, Burlington, Forest Avenue. Um, what was the other street at? Herrick. Berry Point, yep. So we're still waiting on our invoices from the state from that, and we are trying to let those pro those fund balances accumulate due to the restrictions that are placed on us when we do, do use those funds for large projects. Um, it's best if we can pull them for, for large projects in the future. So basically what we have to do now is, is, is let those fund, let that fund replenish, right? Correct. Um, so once that fund replenishes, and I don't know if this is a question for you gentlemen or not, but which is more pressing? Do we have street, street renovations and resurfacing that's more important than, than the alley replacements? Or which, what's the priority on something like this? The scale of the two are not quite the same. An alley, the cost of an alley versus the cost of a street the alley, depending on what, um, you know, we got some quotes for the Kent Alley, and we're, you know, we're talking the $200,000, $250,000 range where a street, you know, could be uh, many times that. In an acute area, I think we all know that Kent Alley has issues. Um, <coughs> but we also have streets that are pressing as well, so, you know, the direction of the board would so, somewhat dictate, you know, what about the possibility of a special service area for the alleys? We did that analysis, I want to say, in early 2019. We can bring that back to the board. My recollection of that discussion was that the adjacent properties to it, which we would have to ask for the special service assessment for, included a large number of residences which did not have access to the alleys but directly abutted it um, so we were worried about getting the support to pass that special service area but couldn't it just be directed toward the multifamily buildings that basically use it as their driveway hi i will oh mr Molina. well i was just going to so we talked about this special service area concept before it's not that you need support. You have to have, you, you, you can't have too many objections to the special service area. So it's the village's job to figure out which properties are benefited by a special service area. That is a rational basis sort of test. And once those properties are identified, it decides that they're in the special service area. It's a public hearing requirement. The special service area is created by ordinance and then there's a period of 60 days where if over 50% of owners and electors has to be both uh, sets of people object, it can kill the special service area, but it's actually passed by ordinance. What's, what's the elector in that phrasing? Vo uh, voters. Voters. R registered voters. Within the area? Yes. Um. When, when that alley was done to the south, the extension to the south, was there not grant funding involved in that? Yes, the, uh, there's two alleys directly to the south, right. which are, uh, we call them green alleys. Yeah. The, um, that was funded primarily through a grant program, and that's as much um, grant funding as we had to do those two sections that were done. It, every, a lot of people were wondering, well, why don't you go all the way through? That's an obvious question. 
<coughs> in fact, that's the limit we, we had with the grant funding that we, uh, we secured. But there's not additional grant funding opportunities to extend it to the north? No, that, that grant fund no longer exists. No, but I'm just a, a, no, a new one. We did apply um, approximately a year ago for an MWRD grant similar to the uh, grant funding that was used for the uh, commuter lot one, and we were unsuccessful. And MWRD has a pretty strict uh, formula, I guess you can say, for calculating benefit um, in solving problems in, in a nutshell. And in my, the way I look at it, we couldn't make the case that, that making that alley into a permeable alley would solve some existing problems. So we tried, okay. and that's the only, um, that type of uh, grant program I'm aware of is like the MWRD permeable uh, paving mm -hmm. type program. Okay. So after all that discussion, it sounds like we really don't have a way to do this, because I, I the, the special service area is unlikely to succeed, given what you just told us. Okay, well, we'll just have to wait and see how this plays out then. Anything else with regard to this initial discussion that you need from us? Thank you very much for all the discussion and input for our capital plan for the upcoming years. <clears throat> I got, I got to say, uh, every year this gets more and more difficult, and every year you all do a better job of somehow making this work that you, I mean, that you were able, and all of our staff, I mean, all of these things that, that we see on the unfunded list are things that are needed. Um, but there's just simply not funding there for it. And so you made the hard decisions, and you pre presented us with a balanced uh, capital improvement plan, and we greatly appreciate your work and expertise. Okay, so we'll move on to our next and final item, which is a discussion regarding enhancing inhabitable spaces above garages. Um, who's going to handle this one? Ms. Francis or Mr. Gisa? Do you just want to talk about this since you brought sure. this idea up? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, I reached out to President Sells on um, conversations that I've been having with, with both local residents and residents from other communities. Um, and also just, you know, continuously reading about the changes that the world is facing right now with regard to um, commercial office space and the, really the end of, of what I believe is the world as we know it. Um, I think a lot more home offices are going to be promoted by uh, major corporations, but also smaller corporations. And um, I think that in Riverside specifically, while you have some larger homes throughout the town, you also have um, bungalow style homes, you know, three bedrooms, one and a half baths, where if you've got one, two, three, four kids in a three bedroom home, it's nearly impossible for dual income families to operate efficiently. Um, and I know that um, for myself personally, I have a coach house, and I'm able to walk out of my house every day and go into my coach house and operate my, my day without any disruption, but others aren't able to do that. Um, I, I feel like I'm using Hinsdale as an example. Um, they actually have uh, home office opportunities above their garages where you cannot have a three-piece facility in order to avoid renters or renting the property itself. But if, if, if these, you know, whether it's a dual-income family or a single-income family, working from home is, home is hard. And that's not going to change anytime soon. That's a fact. Um, so what I'd like to propose is that we start talking about, you know, the opportunity for homeowners in Riverside that live in smaller homes or, or larger homes, it doesn't really matter, dual-income families, single-income families, to be able to build something above their garage, not, not impacting the actual ground itself, not in, a, in addition to their home, so that we can be more visionaries and, and progressive in trying to, to figure out how um, the home office is gonna work well in, in Riverside. You know, they've got, they've got these, these, these tiny offices that you can pop up this, that, and the other, 
but I, but I really feel that, that increasing the property value of a home by, by having this as a resource is something that over the long term will be significant. And, and I do think that the trickle down effect of um, you know, increased property values brings, more, brings higher tax dollars, but also just a little bit more activity in the community um, is significant. Um, and I, this, wouldn't, this wouldn't apply to um, attached garages, but it's something where a detached garage, if done aesthetically correct, would allow someone to work from home and, and have an easier way of life than we're gonna have for the next, for the very long future. If anyone has to ask me any questions, feel free. Yep. This is just for general discussion. Any thoughts, Mr. Pollock? Thank you, and thank you, Trustee Jason. I think it's an excellent idea. It's very timely, um, and I think we should, uh, you know, at the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion to have the Planning Commission start reviewing that. Uh, so can we have, we can have motions during considerations, right? Have motions to what? During considerations. Sure. Or we can just have a consensus. Yeah, or you can just give direction. You don't need a motion, but there's certainly nothing wrong. With it. I'll, I'll second that. If we want to. Okay. okay, so we have a motion and a second. Other discussion about this? Uh, I, I too am intrigued by the idea. Um, you know, the full bathroom aspect of it uh, scares me. Um, you know, I, I having been a guy who lived on my own and did not have a kitchen but a hot plate, I understand how those things can function. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about the, you know, turned into residential space and, and we've all been down that. But the specific issues, I, I'd love to get some input on what other communities are doing. Um, you know, the, the, any restrictions or governance over how many employees, how many clients, you know, would that be a disruption on the neighbors if you were having, you know, running a, a, you know, some sort of therapist office out of your home where you have, you know, 30 people coming to the residence a day, or you're having large meetings, gatherings of 10 people. I mean, is that, is that something that other areas have, have looked at? Um, you know, can you rent the space out, um, you know, home office versus functioning business? You know, is that another thing we want to distinguish well, between the two, that if you're simply using this as a work from home situation, having the occasional meeting versus, you know, this is where you, you know, see clients run your business. Um, is there an issue there? Um, and then I'd also like to see the event, you know, we don't have a lot of office rental in, in the village, but I'd like that to be a consideration as we move forward of, you know, what would be the impact if, you know, you see ads for office share space and other people who work in the village already, um, you know, how, how would that, you know, how much of available office space is available now and, you know, how would that impact on, on future ability? So I, I, I like the idea. I'm intrigued by it. Um, but I think there's a, a lot of, of questions and it'd be, you know, if Hinsdale is doing this, it'd be interesting to see how other communities have addressed those issues. If I could just comment on a couple of those. So I actually rent an office in Riverside. It's actually not an office, it's a condo. <laughs> Um, just to get to, to in a, that a couple of people from my company go to. Um, with that said, the, the purpose of this is, is not to operate a business out of it. It's to have a home office where if it's a dual income family, we are on conference calls, you're on Zoom calls, instead of sitting in a basement with a six foot ceiling, you can actually have a professional setting. And if you could have someone over to sit down and do a call with or a meeting with, it's not meant to run a business out of it's just meant to have a professional environment to work from so that you're not distracted by your children or you know who knows when the world's going to get back to normal but i'll tell you what's not going to get back to normal is, is is the commercial real estate market in the loop um i think that that companies like facebook google um are are promoting work from home and you, even some of the largest law firms in in the chicago market and and global market are telling people don't even come back until this date. And in some cases, the smaller businesses are actually offering incentives. <coughs> um, I, my company, I offer an incentive to employees to work from home. Um, but I also know that, that, that it's difficult to work from home. Um, it's, it's, I think it's an exciting opportunity for Riverside. So if, if I could add something. So what Trustee Hannon is concerned about all the things that he articulated 
are really governed typically in a municipality by what's called a home occupation ordinance. And I th we, we probably have one, right, Jessica? I, we've, yes, we, we, we haven't had enforcement issues, so I'm, and that those ordinances uh, dictate whether in a single family residential neighborhood you can have a commercial use. And in certain cases it is allowed. It's called a home occupation ordinance and there are all sorts of requirements. Like it has to be operated by the owner, uh, can't have clients that visit or minimal or you can't have employees at the, the those ordinances ex exist and have existed for many many years because home occupations are not new uh, and there's been a demand for them and most municipalities allow it but in a very restricted way some home occupations are treated as special uses where they're more intense in some communities so that's one thing what trustee Jesa is proposing is a concern that's usually dealt with trying to avoid having creating rental space within within a structure by having multiple kitchens or something. And so that would be what this ordinance would deal with. The, the one thing the village has in its favor is you do have zoning inspections upon a sale. So that's a good check in order to um, to catch anybody who's who's misused it. Um, Hinsdale's requirements we're very familiar with. I forwarded those, or Michael did to Jessica this afternoon. They do not have home inspections, uh, so they don't have that ability, but Riverside has that extra check. So, but I just wanted to state that the, you probably already have an ordinance that, that covers home occupations and that has li the kind of limitations that Trustee Hannon was, was uh, referring to. Mr. Pollock? Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Um, and that's exactly what I had in mind. I, I, my rec suggestion is that we direct the Planning Commission to look specifically at the home occupation regulations and how they may be modified given current circumstances. For example, I think our regulations say you can't make physical changes to the property to accommodate the home occupation. Well, maybe we want to let people do a little bit of modification uh, and expand on that a little bit because there's no doubt the work from home isn't temporary. It's, a, it's, it's an expanding uh, option that people will want in their homes. So it sounds like there's consensus that we'd like planning and zoning to take a look at this? Yes. Okay. I would. All right. Great. Okay, so that's everything now. Uh, I believe, Mr. Galgos, you had something that you wanted to discuss under new business. Yes, new business, thank you. Um, last year, the Village Board approved flying the POW MIA flag in the month of September out here on the township property. I was kind of surprised that it wasn't flying this year, but apparently it wasn't approved for an annual basis. Um, so we have to put it under new business tonight. Cannot take any action on it. Um, but I fear it's time for us as trustees to take the opportunity of deciding we want to fly the POW MIA flag or not. So I, I was trying to, I believe the, correct me if I'm wrong, so the, the ordinance that we, or the resolution we passed last year was with, in connection to a specific day, right? Yes. Um, I don't have it handy, but there were for it was for a two week period of time. But it was around. But it was it was that two week period was tied to some kind of while well, you're looking for that. <laughs> yes. Um, so I had suggested to, to uh, Mr. Gallagos that perhaps we could just fly the the flag at the Veterans Memorial. Um, you know, just fly it year round, and he pointed out that really that would probably be inappropriate because the the Veterans Memorial is for, are for folks who have lost, basically. And, you know, the POWs and MIAs, God willing, some of the MIAs, we have a chance to still bring them home. So he thought that that might not be a good place to have it. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Gallagher. Yeah, that's, that's um, so uh, what we could do is, is just reenact the ordinance that, or the resolution that we had last year, but make it ongoing so that every September at that date of, of, of remembrance, we, we fly the flag, and that way we wouldn't have to 
reinvent this wheel every single year. Uh, really, the month of remember remembrance is really November, so perhaps we now have time to fly for this year for the month of November, not, not for September. Last year, September was really uh, chosen because that was the 100th, the centennial for the American Legion. So we wanted to fly both flags during that month. Uh, so perhaps November was, uh, would be more appropriate. <clears throat> well, let's, why don't we look into that? Let's do a little research and find when the, uh, the appropriate time would be, and then okay. we can put this, we can, uh, is it okay to put this on our yeah. next agenda once we have more information? Yeah, I, I would just like to state that, that our memorial, and, and I think we, we talked, it was talked, discussed at the board before I joined, um, when we were talking about the improve, improvements that were made. And, and I think it was Trustee Lumpson said that he really views that area as uh, sacred space uh, to the residents that we've lost in the war. So I would be reluctant to fly any flag under the American flag at that, what's viewed by veterans especially as sacred space. So I, I, you know, I, I agree with Trustee Gallagos, you know, around Veterans Day, I think it's important to fly that, that POW MIA flag. Um, but, you know, I, I'm very reluctant to do anything at that I memorial think we area. All, I think we all agree with that. Yeah. I, I did find it. Um, and the resolution was to commemorate and honor those prisoners and personnel by recognizing National POW MIA Recognition Day and by flying of the POW MIA flag immediately below the American flag on the Village of Riverside flagpole outside Township Hall for two weeks, for a two week period commencing on September 20th, 2019. So the, what was the name of the Remembrance Day again? National POW MIA Recognition Day. Okay, so we'll do some research and find what that day is and then we can, as a board, we can determine what when you want to fly it. But it certainly makes sense to me that, that that's something that we would want to display on an annual basis. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we have no need for an executive session this evening. So with that, I'd ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. So moved. By Mr. Gallagos. Second by. Second. Ms. Collins, please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion passes. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you and good night.